Well, good uh, afternoon. This is 2.33. I'm, I'm three minutes late getting started. I've been trying to find out things about weather and to no avail. I haven't found out anything yet, definitive anyway. Uh, but anyway, it's supposed to be differential equations class, and right now I'm the only one in the room. I'll go on and start the slide from here. Uh, as soon as someone comes in, if someone comes in, I have some pretty important announcements to make, but I wanted to wait till at least there's a body in the room. Now, if the end of the class gets here and no one has shown up, then I'll need to make the announcement then. So if you're listening to this from home, uh, be sure you listen till the very end because there is a pretty important announcement that needs to be heard by students. I'd rather someone be in the room when I announce it, okay? But I'll announce it at the end if no one shows up. So let's get the slideshow started. Uh, we're in Chapter 2, First Order of Differential Equations. We did pass out the first test last time or time before. I believe it was the last time. And um, so that has some bearing on what I'm going to say. But anyway, uh, we're on page uh, section 2.1. Solution curves without a solution, which is a strange um, title, okay? And we're on page 38, example two, near the bottom of that page. All right, and actually I had started, let me go back one slide, okay. Example two says use a direction field to sketch an approximate solution curve for the initial value problem, now let me get my pen set up first, okay. Initial value problem dy dx is equal to sine y, okay, and the initial value is when y, when x is zero, y is negative three halves. Now, of course, if you don't see a degree symbol, you assume this is in radians. And that's always a pretty safe assumption that it'll be in radian unless you see that degree symbol. And remember, your y is appears to be something that you would take a sign of, so that would either be in radians or degrees, and since this is given as minus 3 halves, I would have to assume that is radians. Okay. And it says, before proceeding, recall that from the continuity of f of xy, which is what we've got here, is equal to sine y, that's continuous everywhere, and the fact that uh, partial of f with respect to y, so this is also your f of xy, though there is no y, x dependence there, so the partial of f with respect to y, remember that's the other part of our continuity thing, well what is that? That would be cosine y, because f is sine y, partial of f with respect to y would be cosine y, and that's continuous everywhere. So we seem to be okay. Uh, theorem 1, 2, 1 guarantees the existence of a unique solution curve passing through any point x0, y0 on the, in the plane. And our point here is 0, negative 3 halves, right there. 0, negative 3 halves, there's our point. Okay, now, it says use a direction field to sketch the an approximate solution curve for that initial value problem. Okay? Now, so let's plug in what we know. When x is equal to 0, y is equal to minus 3 halves. Well, we can calculate what the derivative is there by doing sine of negative 3 halves. That's going to be your slope at that point down there. Okay, now I just happen to have my calculator, I mean my phone with me today, I usually don't, but because there were no students here, I thought I'd better have it. So let me 
go to my calculator. Uh, I could use one on the uh, uh, my computer, but then it's going back and forth so much. So let's do okay. Um, One point five. What's it didn't take? One point five. Negate that, and then take the sine of that, and that's negative point nine nine. Okay, so your slope there is almost negative one. Negative one would be something yuck in that direction. Okay, so that's where we're heading next. Okay. Um, so let's say we're about here next. I don't know if that's correct or not, but let's do a pretty good guess. That would be um, y of 1 would then be something pretty close to um, negative 5 halves. So let's do that one. 2.5, negate that, and do a sine of that, and now we're up about negative 0.59. So at this point, we're going to be something a little more than negative one half. So that's going that way. Okay. Well, let's just make a guess that we're going to go maybe about to that point. So that's going to be two. Um, negative 3. So we'll do 3 negative sine of that to be negative 0.1411. So that's a very minor slope here. And I don't know, let's just make a guess here that we would be when x is equal to 3 will be something, let's say, negative 3.1. So let's try that one. 3.1, negate that, take the sine of it, and your slope is going to be very, very minor, okay? Almost zero, okay? So let's do uh, 1.5. Looks like we're getting close to leveling off. I don't know if we will, but that's what it appears to be. Now, we didn't do any on the other direction, um, but let's fill in what we can, okay? What we do know is that when y is equal to uh, 0, the sign is always 0. So y is equal to 0, you have your slope is always zero. And when sine is equal to pi halves, well, pi, let's do pi next. Yeah, pi halves, it would be a negative one. That's pretty close to where we started there, okay? And then when we do sine of pi, we're at zero again. Well, pi is 3.14. So that is right around in here. Well, sure enough, we seem to be at a point where we have bottomed out. And we can't get above here, so this is probably coming along like this, and then going along like this, and then can't go any further. So that's a pretty good guess of what our curve is going to be. Not exact, but pretty close, and you see that's pretty much what they've got in the text. Okay? Now, notice we can't cross over. <laughs> you can't go up here anywhere. It can't be because the slopes were zero here. The slopes are zero down here too, 3.14. They're zero again, okay? So you're, you're reaching basically horizontal asymptotes there. And you, since you started in this field, you're not going to get out of that field. You will never get a a y greater than zero, 
you'll never get a y less than negative pi. So we're kind of stuck there. Okay, so that's what will be just about within this range here. Now they do do a little remark. I'm going to turn off this so I can save the battery on my computer. I'm only at 35% right now, so I want to say what I can. Um, there's a remark at the top of the page that says sketching the direction field by hand is straightforward, but time consuming, as we just saw. It's probably one of those tasks, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to read it all. Uh, before calculators, PCs, and software, the method of isoclines was used. And what an isocline is, is iso means equal, cline means elevation. So it's equal elevations, basically like topographic maps. Okay. Now that's all we're going to do on that. We, the next, okay. Next thing we're going to do is talk about things that relate back to this but they don't really do a great job relating. I will try to remind you of how they relate. So let's move on to 2.2. And for this, I will go to a new slide here. Um, and here is a new term, and this is called autonomous. Now I hope that's how you pronounce it. Autonomous first order differential equation. Okay. Now, remember we said first order means the maximum derivative you're taking is a first derivative, first order. Okay. Uh, autonomous, we're going to introduce here, uh, and the definition sort of comes in the middle of that first paragraph. An ordinary differential equation in which the independent variable does not appear explicitly is said to be autonomous. Okay? Now that one we just did, dy dx is equal to sine x. Now sine y. The independent variable, okay, the independent variable x, that's the one down here, x, that's a pretty ugly x, by the way, dx, the x doesn't show up anywhere in the equation except there. So in other words, dy dx is just some function of y with no x dependence. Now you might say, does this happen frequently? Well, if you will, go back just quickly here to some of those examples of differential equations as mathematical models and take a look. Okay, the first one we did, I'm pretty sure, was a population. D, dp dt is equal to kp. No, the t doesn't show up anywhere. Radioactive decay, dA dt is equal to kA. No, the independent variable doesn't show up in the equation. Uh, Newton's law of cooling and warming. dt, the, the top t is temperature. The lowercase t is time. The, the capital change of temperature per change of time is K times temperature minus ambient temperature. No time involved there. Okay. Uh, the next one, dx dt is equal to kxy. No t in that one. Okay. The next one, dx dt, uh, this is a uh, spread of a disease, is equal to kx n plus 1 minus x. No t involved there. Chemical reactions. dx dt is equal to k times alpha minus x times beta minus x. No t involved there. Okay. Mixtures. Um, trying to find the equation there. Uh, the summary equation, dA dt is equal to Rn minus R out, no time there. Uh, let's see if they have any other equation. There's a dA dt plus 1 over 6 times A is equal to T, all a function of A, no function of time. Okay? Um, 
DHDT, this is uh, Torricelli's law. DHDT is equal to minus AH over AW times the square root of 2GH. No time involved in that one. This is a autonomous first, all of these autonomous first order differential equations. Uh, now, the next one is not. Series circuits, where you have L, D2, Q, DT squared, number one, that's second order, plus R, DQ, DT, plus one over CQ is equal to E of T. There the T is part of your thing. So there's one out of all these that is not autonomous. Following bodies, uh, D2, S, DT squared, well, number one, that's second order, uh, but this is minus G. T is not involved there, okay? Following bodies in air resistance, M times dV dT is equal to Mg minus kV. No T on the right-hand side at all, okay? So that's autonomous, okay? Uh, then when you do the second order, it's still autonomous, but it's not a first order difference. Autonomous differential equation. Suspended cables. Dy dx equal W over T I T1. Not uh, no X involved. Okay? So most of those examples were autonomous first order differential equations. Okay? Here are a few other examples and we'll talk about them. Here's dy dx is equal one plus y squared. First order differential equation it is autonomous. There's no x on the right-hand side. Okay? Now, that's not a linear. Remember, they don't have to be linear. They just have to be autonomous here. So, not a linear equation, but it is an autonomous first-order equation. Okay? How about this one? dy dx, and we've seen this one before, is equal to 0 0.2 times xy. That one is not autonomous because it does have x dependence on the right-hand side. And then, like I said, when you go back to 1.3, uh, the ADT is equal to KA. Uh, that was uh, chemical or one or the other. The uh, XDT, those were all autonomous. Okay, done. Now, next thing they bring up is the concept of critical points. Okay? When you have an equation like this, right here, dy dx is equal to f of y, okay? The critical point, the zeros of the function of f, those are of special importance. Where the f is zero, then where that occurs is a value c, and that c is called a critical point. Where f of y is equal to zero, that value for y would be c, a critical point, okay? Or, no, I'm sorry, where f of c is equal to zero, the value c is called a critical point, okay? Critical point is also called an equilibrium point or a stationary point, okay? And the one we looked at here, remember, its equilibrium points were when y is equal to zero, when y is equal to pi, when y is equal to 2 pi, any multiple of pi, those were all uh, critical point. They were the places where your function is equal to zero. Okay? A constant solution, y of x equals c, is called an equilibrium solution. Um, and they go on something about that. So let's move to example three. I think we will start on the clean page here. In fact, I think what I'll do is go back to the graph. Okay. Clear this out of the way. Well, this is going to be similar to some other things we've done. But here's your differential equation. dp dt. Whatever the p is, this doesn't necessarily a population study, but dp dt is equal to P times A minus 
B times P. There's your differential equation. Where A and B are both positive quantities. Okay? Now, that's autonomous because you could say that's equal to F of P. Okay? Now, where would that be zero? Now, here we have T is your independent variable, P is your dependent variable. Well, where is, does P have a zero? Well, certainly at P equals zero. So down here, you have a critical point, P equals zero. Okay? And then the slope there is always going to be zero. So I could put arrows on all these lines. Because they're all zeros there. That's an equilibrium point, zero point, or equal, you know, have various names for a stationary point, critical point. Okay? But that's not the only place. This is also zero, the slope is zero, where A minus B. P equals zero if you add BP to both sides. You get A is equal to BP and then divide by B. Then P is equal to A over B. Now remember A over B is positive. Both A and B are positive, so A over B is positive. Um, so, wherever that is, and let's just pick a point up here and call this point uh, P equal A over B. Okay? Now, we know that along that point, the slope is always zero as well. I just arbitrarily put it in the middle there just so you could see the lines a little better. Okay? All right. All along there, you've got zeros. Okay. Now, what is the function doing on either side of those critical values? Okay? Um, and I'm not sure, um, it says by putting on the vertical line, which we have on the y-axis there, or the p-axis in this case, uh, we divide it into all values from negative infinity up to zero, and between zero and a over b and between a over b and positive infinity. The arrows indicate the algebraic signs for that f of p on those intervals and so far I haven't quite figured out where they got this. Hey. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I had another instructor come in and ask, because of the weather outside, what's going on. So since no one was in my class and there were two people in his, I went down to check to see if the administration has come out with any word. Of course they haven't. And uh, so I don't know uh, what's going to happen today. Like I say, if it gets to be in the class and we still haven't heard anything, then I'll make the announcements that I was going to make earlier, or if someone comes in, but right now, so far, nobody's here yet. Okay. Now, what I was saying, I was reading from the book, um, it says A and B are positive constants, okay, and Okay. All right, got it. Okay. Anytime you're down here, of course, P is negative. Okay? And the slope, um, what I mean, anywhere from, okay, we've got this in the three 
sectors, you might say. Negative infinity less than P less than zero. Okay? So down there, P is always negative. Okay? Everywhere below here, P is always negative. Okay? And if P is negative, and A and B are both positive, then uh, P being negative, and A minus B, well, it depends on which one's bigger, okay? And they don't say that. They don't say which is the case, okay? Uh, but your dp, dt, uh, you're just getting more and more negative as you go, so the assumption is you're going, uh, the functions are pointing in that direction down there, okay? Now, in your, if you're in the middle region here, uh, where t is between, or p is between uh, 0 less than p less than a over b, that region there, uh, anywhere in here, um, your p is positive, and it appears to be getting more positive, okay? a minus bp, and again, they don't say whether the b is greater than a or not, uh, but obviously your p is quite small here, so the odds are a is, is, is greater, so that would be positive. So here, you're on the upswing in here, okay? And up here, you're in the region between a over b less than p is less than positive infinity. Well, here p is very, very large, okay? And uh, a minus bp, whatever it is, uh, After a while, the BP is larger than A, you know, and so that makes this negative, that positive, so the product of them has to be going downhill. So this shows the directions that the um, vector fields will be taking, or I say vector fields, the, uh, the different Let's see, what do they call them? Uh, um, direction fields, I guess it's just what they call them. Direction fields are going. It's going downhill in the top third part of it, up in the middle part, and down in the lower part. Okay? Uh, that's going to be your sign of P. So P has to be decreasing in the upper part, increasing in the middle part, and uh, decreasing in the lower part. Now that itself, just the vertical axis there, uh, is called a one-dimensional phase portrait, okay? Of uh, that differential equation just showing, uh, and the vertical line is called the phase line. So what is it doing in there? It has to be going in these directions, okay? Um, now, what do your solution curves look like? Without solving an uh, autonomous differential equation, we can usually say a great deal about the solution curves. Okay? And they say a lot. Okay? So let's say that we have a point, uh, and this is not necessarily the same as example three. I would be tempted to use that, but their curve is not like that. So let's go to a clean curve here. If I can get this to erase. Okay. And they just pick a point. Um, They say since the function f is um, in 2 is not dependent on the variable 
uh, x, we can consider f defined for all minus infinity, all values of x, because there's no x dependence listed. Okay? Or, if, say, conditions indicate, maybe just all positive x's, or wherever it, it's good. Also, since f and its derivatives of f prime are continuous functions of y and only y on some interval i of the y-axis, the fundamental results uh, hold for some horizontal strip uh, or region r in the xy plane. It's just a lot of blah, blah, blah here. Um, All right. They say, finally, um, well, let us see. I'm trying to pick up where they introduce it. Think here. For the sake of discussion, let's suppose that your equation 2 possesses exactly two critical points, C1 and C2, sort of like our last one did, okay? Uh, with C1 being less than C2. And they don't tell us anything about them, but on their graph, they show C1 to be, say, something like this. This is C1, and C2 to be something like this, both positive. Now, there's nothing magic about that. That's just how they showed it, okay? And that breaks it into three regions, R1 they show down here, R2 up here, and R3 up here. If you only have two critical points, it'll be something like this. It may be scattered anywhere else on the xy plane. This is what you would have. So what if your x0, y0 happened to be in here? In other words, the value where you do know something about. Okay? Once you're in that, then you know that from here you're going to be approaching your critical value here. This one probably was approaching somewhere back there. You can't cross the critical points, okay? So if x1 or x0, y0 is in subregion R sub i, um, this, the curve stays within that region because all the x's in the non constant solution cannot cross the graph of any of your critical values. By continuity of f, we have then that either f of y is greater than 0 or less than 0 for all x's in the subregion. Okay? So, in other words, it can't change signs. Okay? Now, since your dy dx is f of xy, it's either positive or negative. In other words, the, the slope is either positive or negative, it's either increasing or decreasing. That one, we said, happened to be look like it was decreasing. If yx is bounded above by a critical point, uh, as in r1 that they show here, then you have to have that as a horizontal asymptote. Okay? Uh, but it could be doing anything going downward. Okay? However, in r2, it's either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. R3 is approaching C2 one way or another. If it's an increasing function, it would be from the left. If it's a decreasing function, it would be approaching C2 from the right. Okay? Um, so anyway, that's what they're supposing there. Let's do example four, and maybe that will help it make more sense. The other was just sort of blah, blah, blah. Um, Supposing this, supposing that. Here's example four. The three intervals determined on the p-axis or phase line by the critical point zero and a over b. Now we go back to that one. Uh, here's your first. C1 and whatever I chose this one up here to be. This is a over b. Okay, this is that one we did before. Okay. Now, this is your R1 down here, where uh, negative infinity less than P is less than 0. Okay? 
your R2 up here uh, is 0 is less than P is less than A over B. And up here, R3 is such that A over B is less than P is less than positive infinity. Okay. And T, this is the T axis here. Uh, this is the P axis here. T can be any real number. They're not limiting us to positive or negative or anything else. Okay. Now, what we said before, your function is always decreasing in R1, always increasing in R2, and always decreasing in R3. What we did before. Okay? If P of 0 is equal to P0 is some initial value, and that initial value is, say, right here, if that's your P0, then you know that the function has to be increasing in this direction and de increasing everywhere in that range. Okay? If your P0 happened to be here, then wherever it was up here, we don't know, but... It has to pass through P0 and has to be approaching your horizontal asymptote here. This may go up forever. It may do anything. Same thing down here. If your P0 was, say, here, then you don't know or don't really care right now what it's doing here, but it would be coming in from here, going out here, and either going down, smoothing out, doing whatever it wants to, but always decreasing. Okay? Now, that's all we're talking about here uh, because it has to be approaching your critical value as a horizontal asymptote, okay? And you know the direction of motion, so or, of increase and decrease, so that tells you what slope you have. And you know P0 is the point it has to go through, so you pick that point, okay? Now, now... You're not going to have three, three zeros. You're only going to have one. But whichever one you have, that's where you're going to be, and you're going to be stuck there. You can't be anywhere outside of this. Okay. So let's move on to example five. I think example five will still be using a graph, so let's erase this. Now, I have to keep up with time now because... Um, I have to leave, let's see if I got this right, um, yeah, um, yeah, we were, this class goes 2.30 to 3.45. Three eighteen now, so we have thirty more minutes. Probably not quite, but close. Okay, so let's do example five. An autonomous equation dy dx is equal to one minus y, y minus one squared. Okay, there's your autonomous differential equation. Okay, now. The only critical value you have is that y is equal to 1. Okay? That is going to make that 0, so your slope here is 0. All along that line. Because that's going to make it 1. Now, everywhere, no matter what value, oh, yeah, no matter what value y you are, these are increasing functions. Okay? So it's an increasing function here. You only have two regions here. Region 1 is minus infinity less than y is less than 1. Okay? Up here, region 2, again, increasing function. The derivative is always increasing. This is 
region 2, and this is 1 is less than y is less than positive infinity. Okay? Now, has to be increasing everywhere. this one, this is your x, this is your y, okay? Now, Get everything I've done there. Now, out of the blue, they tell us that y of x is equal to 1 minus 1 over x plus c is a one-parameter family of solutions for this differential equation. Okay? Now, it says, see problem 4 in exercise 2.2. Kind of gripes me how this book does this. It's going up to the next section over that we haven't even gotten to yet, and that's where they say, you know, you can see this and see it's true. Why don't you pick something that is, you know, you can deal with now? Okay? Now, a part of me wants to say, let's take a derivative and see what happens and, and set this up. They're not suggesting that, and I have a feeling there's a reason for it, okay? Um, but anyway, they say that's a solution, okay? Yeah. Um... Well, they said, oh yeah, here's an initial condition. Y of zero is equal to Y zero. Okay. Y at zero is equal to Y zero. And they also tell you this Y zero is less than one. Okay. Now what does that mean? When X is equal to zero, your uh, Y value, your initial condition, there has to be less than 1, below your critical value, okay? So, it doesn't matter where you put it, but it's somewhere down there, okay? has to be less than 1. Now, Here they say, let's suppose that y of 0 is equal to minus 1. So up here they just gave it this. Now they're saying y at 0 is equal to minus 1. And certainly that's less than 1. Okay? So at 0, x equals 0, y is equal to minus 1. There's your point. Okay? Now, as x is increasing, well, as y is increasing, uh, this is moving in this direction here. Can't ever cross that, okay? Now, let's see what happens here. y of 0 is equal to 1 minus 1 over 0 plus c, and that's equal to minus 1. y of 0 is equal to minus 1. So this says 1 minus 1 over C is equal to minus 1. Let's flip places of these two, and that gives you 
1 plus 1 is equal to 1 over C. Okay, which means that C is equal to 1 half, because this is equal to 2, so that would mean C is equal to 1 half. You plug that in here, and you get 1 minus 1 over um, 3 halves, okay, which would be 1 minus 2 over 3, which would be one third. There's a problem here. Wait a minute. I did something wrong there. Let me erase some of that. I'm sorry, I think I plugged in a value where I should have been putting in a variable. Okay. C is one half, that be one minus one over. X plus a half. Okay. So there's your Y as a function of X. Okay. Now, What if, on the other hand, now one thing I, okay. If this was the case then, and we've been assuming that, then obviously you have, I hope it's obvious to you, that then x cannot equal negative one half, right? Because then this would be, so here we have a vertical asymptote I usually do them in red, but I'm going to do this one here, at negative one-half. So then you have to come down here. So that sort of completes the curve if your initial condition was y is equal to negative one, but y of zero is negative one. If, however, and then they do this one, what if your um, x was equal to your initial condition y of 0 is equal to 2. Okay, now that's obviously greater than 1. Okay? Now your original part of the problem Oh, I'm sorry, I misread. For initial condition y of 0 is equal to y1 less than 1, less than below your value there, uh, then this is what you wound up, that curve we have there. Uh, in the book, that's the blue curve. Okay? Um, if, however, you had y of 0 is equal to 2, that's greater than 1. Um, Basically, you have a different situation here. 
Now, I've been trying to figure out since if this is your initial condition, uh, 0 minus 1, that's the first case they gave us, then um, you came up with x can't be one, uh, negative 1 half, uh, y has equal 1 is a horizontal asymptote, then the only place left for this to be is somewhere up here, okay? And that's fine, okay? has to be increasing. You can't have the same values across there, so it has to be somewhere up here. We're not using that because that wasn't part of our initial value, initial conditions. It can't be up there, but for other situations, then that would be okay there. Now, to do the next one, and this is what was throwing me off a little bit, is now they've changed everything, okay? And all your, well, I should have kept some things. Uh, when your y of 0 is equal to 2, which, of course, is going to be greater than 1, now you're up here in this range, and 0 is equal to 2, you're up here, all right, and you have to be increasing there. Now, let's plug that into our y of x is equal to 1 minus 1 over x plus c. And we know that y of 0 is equal to 1 minus 1 over c. Okay? And that is equal to 2. So we've got negative 1 is equal to 1 over c. I just added that to both sides, subtracted this from both sides. And so c is equal to negative 1. Okay, and that's what we've got here. I was looking at the wrong place. So now your function is y of x is equal to 1 minus 1 over x minus 1. Okay, in this case, your y and your vertical asymptote is at x equal 1. I usually do that in red, but I'm going to do it here. Still have your horizontal asymptote there. So this function has to be going like this and like this. And your other side will be down here. But that's immaterial for what we've got now, okay, except for the fact they indicate this goes through to 0. And... I'm not sure why that would be the case, but if it is, okay, yeah, I think I do see why it would be the case. Uh, if this is your function, then when x is equal to 2, y of 2 would be 1 minus 1, which would be 0. So 2, 0 would be on that. And then your function looks something like that. But this is your initial condition. You're not down there. But if you were down there, that's where you would have to be. So anyway, there is your uh, condition if you had different initial condition. It changes your graph. It changes the shape. It changes everything. And it changes which wing of the graph you may be on. Okay? Okay. Uh, The next topic they sort of talk about here are attractors and repellers. And they go back to your direction fields. Okay. I'm going to erase this because I think we'll be doing other things here. 
Um, about Ten minutes. Suppose that y of x is a non-constant solution of an autonomous differential equation, um, and c is a critical value of that differential equation. There are basically three types of behaviors that y can exhibit near c. Okay. Um, and they show this in the phase lines that we were doing. And uh, let's go back to the one where y is equal to 1 is our critical value. So you have horizontal slope here. Not ever going to be able to cross it because the slope's always 0 there. You can't get across from the top of the bottom. So they're considering three situations here. Okay, this is your critical value C, and they're telling you that Y zero is somewhere down here. Okay, now three possibilities here. If your function is going downhill here and uphill here, then your Y your function has to be approaching the C that way, and that's called an attractor, okay? No choice about it, okay? Now, they're going to change everything here. We're going to leave the C alone, okay? But now they're going to change your Y0, okay? And we're going to change your direction arrows. Okay? Now, this time we have this one going up, this one going down. Okay? If your Y0 is up here now, okay, then this is a repeller. It can't be going toward this, it has to be going away from this. And this had to be coming in from there. So that's called a repeller. Okay? Now, let's leave the Y0 the same and your up arrow the same, but let's change our down arrow here. Okay? Make that an up arrow here. Now, if your Y0 is up there, that doesn't change anything about your function motion here, okay? All that would change would be what's happening underneath, okay? And now that would be attracting at C from below, repelling from C above, whereas the previous one would be repelling in both directions. Then let's go to the next case. Let's bring our y0 back downhill. And this time we're going to reverse both of these directions and have this function going here, this function going there. Uh, your y sub 0 is down here. Okay, this has to be, since the slope has to be downhill, that has to be repelling. Okay, All right. Let's 
It's trying to look at the conditions. I think what we'll do, I'm going to erase these, and we're going to split just sort of like they did in the book. Um, I'm going to put one set here, one set here, and we'll just pick a place for the third one, the fourth one. Um, just, just do it. Well, let's try to get them even like they did. Okay. Um, let's take this one off. Okay. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's do one here and take this one off. Do one here and then one here. Those will be our four things. So, just pick our critical value. Why not we do it just like we did before? There's your C. That's going to be the same for all. Now, this one is going to have a Y0 down here. And this is going to be with the arrow up here and down here. here. Okay? Obviously, this has to be going in this direction, okay? It doesn't matter what's up here, but that's what we're going to call a asymptotically stable situation, okay? Uh, because as X is increasing, both of these are heading towards C, okay? Now, on the second one, here's your Y0 up here, okay? And we have this going up and this going down, okay? This one's going to be going like that, obviously, and this is going down this way, too, so that's asymptotically unstable. Your, here your C is an attractor from both above and below. This is an unstable situation because whatever is happening here is going away, so this is a repeller, okay? The next case is your Y0 here, and you're up here, and up here, okay? So again, you're going up like this, but you're going, also, this would be having to go like this, okay? Because it's constantly increasing. That is what we call a semi-stable. This is unstable, where it's going away in both directions. Coming in, that's an attractor, uh, which is asymptotically stable. This is repeller, which is uh, unstable. This is a repeller for Y, but attractor, Y0, but attractor underneath. So that's a semi-stable situation. And then your last one here is the Y0 again down here. And this time your arrows are down and down and again this one would have to be going like this and this one would have to be going like that again a semi-stable situation uh repeller from above at the y0 your your c is a repeller but it's an attractor from above so it's a semi-stable situation now i don't know why they go into that okay um but they do show, um, I'm going to take, get rid of all these and show what they've got going on here. Here again, y is equal to 1 is your critical value. Your c is equal to 1. And here we're going up in this way and down in this way. Okay? So that's going to be direction field for our autonomous differential equation, and I'm pretty sure, trying to find the figure, uh,
that just shows the direction fields. Okay. One such situation of this would be this one. Uh, dy dx is equal to 2 times y minus 1. So y equal 1 is your critical value. Okay. And in this case, for y is greater than 1, your slope is positive. Uh, yeah, the slope is positive. So yeah, you're going up like this. And for y less than 1, your slopes are down, negative. So that would be your situation. There's your direction field wherever you are in them. Okay? Now the next thing they talk about here, and again, they just bring these things up and leave them and don't do anything else with them. Uh, this is actually called a translation property. And here's your differential equation for this one. dy dx is equal to y times 3 minus y. Okay. It has two critical values. Y is equal to 0. That certainly is 1. And y is equal to 3. That's equal to 1. Okay. So you have region 1 down here. This is going back to what we did before. That minus infinity is less than y is less than 0. Okay. Region 2 up here, a little different from before, but similar. That 0 is less than, not equal to less than y is less than 3. And up here, region 3 is 3 is less than y. It's less than positive infinity. Okay. Now, Okay, trying to see what they're doing with this one, and so far I haven't seen it. Okay. Uh, I guess you just do it by looking at these. Anytime that you're above 3, your 3, of course, is positive. I mean, your y is positive, And 3 minus y is negative. So this has to be in this direction. So your curves are all coming down this way in every circumstance. In the middle here, y is positive, and 3 minus y is also positive, so these are up, okay? And the only way they can move, they have to be approached, you know, coming from here, going to there, coming from here, going to there, coming from here, going to there. Those would be possibilities there. Down here, your y is negative, of course, and 3 minus y is going to be positive, so this is going to be negative. So here your curves are like this, like this, 
like this. Okay. Now, I don't really know why they're focusing on this, but they're spending a lot of time on it. Now, the next thing they talk about is a translation property of an autonomous differential equation said should make sense. If y of x is a solution of an autonomous differential equation, dy dx is equal to f of y, then y1, which is y times x minus k, where k is a constant, is also a solution. Okay? Now, That basically comes from the fact that the the values for x don't matter, okay? So that's also going to be a solution, okay? Trying to see where the next problem is coming from here. And it's just saying if you multiply the y by a x minus k, you just shift your solution to the right five units, okay? And that's what they do when, when, when you do an x minus, yeah. So if your first solution was e to the x, now the new solution would be e to the x minus 5. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of mystery meat on that one. Okay, we are running. Whoa, we've gone over. Sorry about that. Okay. Homework exercises, 2.1, direction fields, any of the odds that are in the back of the book, 1 or 3. Uh, any of the odds are in the back of the book 5 through 11, uh, 13, 15, if those are in the back. Okay? And 2.1.2, autonomous first order differential equations. Do number 19 if it's in the back. Any of the odds 21 to 27 if they're in the back. And 29 if it's in the back. Next time we'll start with really solving differential equations. Separable equations 2.2. Sorry we went over. I was trying to keep up with time and I got lost. So, anyway, don't end this. I'm going to be 